Well, good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone who is uh, listening. Thank you for uh, joining us on the Generation Podcast. If you're new to the podcast, we try to think about uh, God's uh, mission in God's world and usually have a, a Scottish flavour uh, to, to, the, to the podcast uh, today. However, we're, we're broadening our horizons and we're inviting uh, a brother from uh, the US who's served in different contexts throughout the world. Uh, his name's John Hogland. He's a global partner with Training Leaders International, and he is currently a lecturer at Hanoi Bible College. Uh, right now, he's uh, based in Minnesota um, and is hoping in the coming year to return to um, his place of service in Hanoi. Uh, so without further ado, uh, thank you, John, uh, for joining us on the podcast. Oh, thank you so much, Martin. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, John, just to kick things off, uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, um, about your family, ministry, and maybe places that you've been involved in serving? I uh, would love to hear uh, those things. Yeah, thanks, Martin. We've, my wife and I have served in missions uh, since 2005, and we have four children, ages from 16 down to four years old. And we have served in both uh, Ukraine and Eastern Europe and then in Vietnam. So our first term of service was in, in Ukraine, in central Ukraine. And then after doing studies in the United States, we moved and switched cultures completely and decided to um, see what the Lord might do in Hanoi in northern Vietnam. So how did that, how did that, um, how did that change come about, Ukraine uh, to, to Vietnam? How, how did that kind of come about? Well, we've always felt God called us to a particular type of ministry, and that is theological education, so training leaders for the church around the world. And so the invitation to Ukraine was a, was a great place for us to grow in that and to see leaders trained. And at the same time, Ukraine, especially at that time, was a very peaceful and open country. There were a lot of missionaries, a lot of theological education institutions at work there. And so when we came back to the United States to pursue further education, we felt like the Lord left the door open to say where we might serve. And the um, while looking at lots of different options in Eastern Europe, in, in the back of my head, there was this idea, maybe the Lord would call us someplace else and a place where our particular calling toward theological education was more in need. And after the invitation of a friend to look into Vietnam, we felt like this is a, this is a place where, where God is at work, but where there's not a whole lot going on in terms of training leaders for the church. If you, even if you look at, um, look at nations in Southeast Asia, there's some powerful powerful uh, Christian theological institutions in places like Indonesia and Philippines or Singapore. And, and Vietnam is a, was, a, was and is a bit of a black hole for formal theological education. So when, when I heard there was an opportunity to, to live in Hanoi, to work in a Bible college, to do so openly and um, with the approval of the authorities, we felt like this is a this is a way God may use us, even though it meant dropping six years of experience in a Russian speaking Eastern European setting and switching to a completely different language group, Asian culture and um, life. Mm -hmm. So it was a big switch. Yeah, I, I, I can imagine uh, it would be quite a quite a change. Um, but it is wonderful to, to, to hear that. As, as God was opening those things up and, and putting those uh, situations, scenarios in front of you, you guys were able to, to work through. Yeah, I think this is where the Lord is leading us um, to. Can I just hit pause for a second and go back a little bit, which is, okay, so you're involved in theological education. You guys have a passion for that. Um, you serve cross-culturally. How did, how did that come about? Um, did you, when you were a kid, um, have this sense that this is what you're supposed to do? Was it maybe whilst you were training? Um, can you just talk around about that for a little bit? That would be really helpful, I think, for, for our listeners. And a call to missions comes from all sorts of different directions, doesn't it? Yeah. And, and cross-cultural work in particular is... Um, yeah, it demands a certain type of character and skill set, and then calling from God that is established over time. And you can't, you can't, you can't pick one sort of trajectory for the how that happens. 
Um, for myself and my wife, they're even a little bit different. For me, as I, I grew up in a Christian family, but I also grew up in a family that where my father was in the United States Air Force. And so we moved pretty frequently. Uh, so I was born in the Netherlands. We lived in Japan and several other places around the United States. And so, so the idea of, cross, of living in a different country or cross-culturally was on my radar screen pretty early, even though as a, in the American military, you kind of live on an American island wherever you go, right? Because there's because there's such a such a culture there. But the idea of being uh, of being of living cross culturally was at least an open option from the beginning. And as I grew in the faith in uh, as a as a as a young man, I felt I felt definitely a call toward ministry and whether God might use me in preaching and teaching. And then as I went to my undergraduate studies. I found a real love for studying the Bible and particularly the biblical languages. And in that, I hadn't clarified whether that would be in a pastoral role or in something different. And as I went on to a, um, to a master's degree program, um, I, I felt, I felt, a, I felt a, a burden to say the, the need is great for cross-cultural theological education around the world. And, and I might be suited for that. And perhaps God would call me to that type of ministry. And so then, then through, a, through a recommendation of a, of a professor who said, I have a friend in Ukraine. He'd really love somebody who could teach Hebrew. Why don't you give him a call? And so I did and thought, this is, this is the sort of opportunity I, uh, I, was, I felt the Lord was leading me toward, where, where my particular desires and gifts and um, c- could be used for the sake of God's kingdom in a in a in a way that th- that yeah that's very particular, namely for for so I went went as a thinking I'd teach Hebrew never never actually did that taught a whole bunch of other different things. Um, the it's, the it's the, really the case isn't it that's that's yeah. totally the way. <laughs> yeah, the the guy who invited me actually left left that field shortly after I arrived, and so the so our our sort of network changed a little bit. But the Lord had provided us a great team. My wife and I um, uh, actually got married in preparation before we before we moved overseas. She had been she had desired to do missions work for a long time. And had grown up hearing a lot of missionary biographies and was really enthusiastic about God's work around the world. And so when, um, when we came together and we fell in love, that, that, was a, that was a natural direction for us together. And so the, all those things, you know, joined together and pulled us to Ukraine. And we, we, were, we were just overjoyed by what the work that was ongoing and that we could step into and help with. The, the, since from the fall of the Soviet Union in the late 1980s, there, there really was a, a, a wave of theological education in Eastern Europe in a place where it had been maligned or put underground or made very difficult. And so through the 90s, early 2000s, there, there was a strong surge of people eager to get um, deeper biblical education, and even for uh, pastors and churches to figure out how they were going to train their leaders. And so we were able to be involved in that there in Ukraine uh, until until 20, 2011. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that was the call for us into, into missions. It's, it's nice, I think, um, just even personally, to, to, to hear that there were a number of different factors. Uh, and And from my experience, limited as it is, uh, of other people who have been taking that journey into serving cross-culturally, um, it tends not to just be this bolt completely out of the blue. It is the, the, the build-up of what they hear preached in the Word, what they read in uh, God's Word, uh, different different aspects of, of life and the way that God is leading them, drawing them together. Um, and I think that's something to encourage people with as well. I'm sure you'd agree with that, that it, it, it may not be this one big moment that that, that really uh, sparks um, that call to cross cultural mission. It can be a, a leading of God over a, a prolonged period of time, and and just that really clear, uh, deep understanding that you know God deserves to be glorified amongst the nations, 
uh, he will be and that you know there's a part for people to to, to join in that process maybe not all as theological educators <laughs> but yeah, well, uh, <laughs> well and however that may however may god may lead in that but the the recognition that i don't i don't have to wait for mm. a a sovereign lightning bolt yeah Right, that God's leading can be done in in so many different ways. That 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 you know, appropriating the the people around us, our sense of God's purpose in the world, our desire to be involved in what He is doing, because that because we because we trust like that's that's the most crucial thing. I remember I was I was asked to speak on this. I mean, as a very young man, and I was really impressed by by Isaiah fifty two um, on how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of Him who brings good news. And and as I, I as I was thinking through that, you this this idea that that the feet of those who bring good news are genuinely beautiful and actually significant that that astounded me. And so I was I was reminded of the the story of the of of what could be called the first marathon, but the the story in Greek history of the runner who who runs to tell the news and and then dies, you know, in dramatic form a, after the the defeat of the Persians at the Battle of Marathon, runs back to Athens at 26 miles. And the 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 fascinating thing about that story is that the 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 account of it is is quite late the you know so in Herodotus who's contemporary to the battle not contemporary to but but uh, shortly after the battle of Marathon he uh, doesn't include that story and and so the only the instances are a couple hundred years later so it, at least it makes us question you know maybe maybe it's not actually maybe it didn't happen quite in that way and so. When I when I think about that the, the this person bringing good news and how beautiful are those feet, the natural story I want to think of is this one from from Greek history, which may not even be true. And so it it, it struck me that that when God promises us that He is actually at work in our gospel proclamation by the power of His Spirit and because of the sufficient work of His Son, we can have confidence that that our labor is not in vain right that he is with us in that in a way that surpasses even what we might call great historical events in in history that that to me is uh, yeah it's such a reminder that we if we have the eyes to see it as god sees it then 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 he is he he, he is there and he's promised to be there wow. nice john that's a really great encouragement um, I'm sure for all of us that are listening, um, you you guys at the very beginning, uh, I was saying you guys are global partners with TLI, uh, Training Leaders International. Do you want to just fill us in a little bit about that organisation? Um, where are they based? Uh, what do they do? Um, and how long have you been part of that ministry? Yeah, so Training Leaders International has existed for just 12 years now, so we're a relatively new organization, and we're dedicated toward the task of theological education for the church. And so we point out that 85% of, of pastors in the world have no formal theological training. So that's, a, I mean, now that could be, that's, that's great. There's, there's lots of people preaching the word, leading God's church, but, but we exist for that 85% to say, how can we how can we help foster deep thinking, meaningful exposition of God's word and proclamation of the gospel for church leaders around the world? So the leaders there are our church leaders. And so TLI uh, is based out of Minneapolis, Minnesota, and we provide both um, a, a non-formal curriculum and training for basically exegesis and exposition, reading the Bible, studying the Bible, and then presenting it as a, and proclaiming it in the church for sites all over the world. And then also we, on the second side, we, we, we help start and facilitate quality theological institutions. Mm -hmm. Some of those are church-based where a group of churches wants to be really intentional about the training of their leaders and training leaders international can help provide some of that expertise others in, in other cases it is having resident cross-cultural workers work within a school in a given location and so that's the sort of work we do in hanoi where um, hanoi bible college is a is set up by the denomination in Vietnam. And as, as Training Leaders International, we come in with them to help advise and then teach and, uh, and, and 
and bring in the the, the formal academic element mm. to a uh, to a theological institution. That's that's really nice to to, to hear about that. As as a, a denomination, uh, many people who are listening to the podcast will uh, be uh, those who are, are part of the Free Church of Scotland. As a denomination, these are things which really align with our vision of ministry and cross-cultural mission to be involved in church planting and theological education and it's just really nice to to hear of another uh, organization uh, in the world um, mm -hmm. that are looking to do that and, and align so well with um with that vision that we we hope to partner in uh, going uh, going forward um it's, mm -hmm. it's just nice to hear about that um what i'll do is uh, maybe put up uh, a link in the episode notes um, to TLI um, yeah, so people can follow up on that uh, as well. Um, I'm going to change tack a little bit. Um, we've done a bit about chatting about past, how you got involved, TLI, etc. Um, both of the places that you've, you've served in, either previously in the Ukraine or presently uh, in Vietnam, are uh, places that have had communist influence. Uh, and I was just wondering if you could maybe speak to what are some of the unique challenges that you can identify from those contexts? Um, mm -hmm. And maybe as a subsequent subset question, uh, are there any lessons that you've learned from being in those sorts of contexts that would really um, helpfully apply into um, the, the, the context of, of churches in, I don't really like the term Western world, but you know what I mean, like in, in mm -hmm. UK or in, in North America? Absolutely. Thanks, Martin. The, 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 they are both, they both each have a communist history and that does flavor the sort of ministry we do there. It's interesting, Ukraine and Vietnam are also sort of little brother countries next to much larger, culturally similar countries. So I don't know if, if that says something about our character that we ended up in these two places, but the, 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 post, the communist background and the, uh, the little brother complex are both there. The, <laughs> Um, so one thing you notice actually is, is is some of the even architecture. So the in Ukraine and Russia they have these five story apartment buildings called Khrushchevskys from the time of Khrushchev that are very very um, bland and extremely tiny apartments and originally had sort of communal kitchens and these sort of things. And I was, you know, not surprised, but, uh, you know, you arrive in Vietnam in Hanoi and then in some of the older sections, they have these very similar uh, buildings. So you have this influence. Um, in fact, one of our first months there, we walked into a pharmacy and the lady started speaking to us in Russian. This is a Vietnamese woman. And so... I went, well, I mean, I, I do understand Russian. I can, I can respond to you in Russian, even though I'm trying to learn Vietnamese and realize that she was someone who had, you know, 30 years ago had spent time in the Soviet Union and who spoke Russian uh, from that. So you have that influence. In fact, many Vietnamese believers were actually came to know the Lord by being outside of the country. And in the 80s and early 90s, that was primarily um, communist or post-Soviet countries such as East Germany or in, uh, in, in Russia. And so there, there is an interesting connection between those two parts of the world. In fact, uh, Nha Chang, a, a city in southern Vietnam, is really full of Russian tourists every, I mean, every season of the year because it's a beach town. And it's sort of like the designated um, place where Russians go for, for getting away to the beach in, uh, in, in Vietnam. Vietnam. So we have that sort of a connection. The and there are some similarities between the culture on the on the on on one side just like many of the post-Soviet countries moving away from the very authoritarian hierarchical a uh, Soviet way of practice of Soviet governance in the 20th century leads to can bleed into kind of hierarchical authoritarian forms of government in all of life, including church life. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, I think that's a, a common feature that can be a challenge. Mm -hmm. The idea to, to, and, and this would apply to both of those cultures very broadly, to bring in people into a discussion where there's critical evaluation and constructive criticism is, is still a lingering difficulty given the history of top-down, directive-only, um, you know, command-oriented leadership styles. Mm -hmm. So that, I think that's actually similar in both of those countries to some extent. Mm -hmm. 
that said, they've also had two very different histories. Uh, yeah. Vietnam still has the Communist Party as the, the leader and considered the driver of, of the country. And, um, and Ukraine doesn't. Uh, Ukraine watched that sort of slip away, entered into a period of relative chaos, and emerged with a new sort of foundation that's a bit different. Whereas, whereas Vietnam slipped out of the old communist command-oriented economy into something new on the economic front, but not so much on the political or the religious front. Mm. So one thing I would emphasize about the church in particular in both of those places was that the church in Ukraine, the, the Baptist churches we worked with, and then the Evangelical Church of Vietnam are very aware of how a congregation meeting to, to worship Christ is a political act. Mm. So there's, there's no doubt that it's a political act in a in a in a communist society when you decide to have a private meeting with people of like mind where you proclaim that there is another king namely jesus it's very evident and so this this was in ukraine this was very evident in that in every town in ukraine the the baptist church which is the main evangelical denomination was always the oldest baptist church was always located on the very edge of the town Mm -hmm. And, and that was very intentional, right? There was a, in the 1930s, they had sort of, uh, Stalin had eliminated many of the churches. And in the, after the Second World War, there was a little bit more toleration of, of Christians. And so they were given this opportunity to build the church, but it was always, you know, way out, way out of the, of the, of the main central city. And so there was a, there was a distancing there and it was a big thing for people to make their way out there on a Sunday morning in order to worship with God's people. Um, so they experienced that as a political act. Mm -hmm. In, in Vietnam, we have the same thing. The church where our Bible college is located is, is actually the, the church that was founded by um, missionaries with the Christian and Missionary Alliance in 1915. And so it's, a, it's right in the center of the city. And, and yet it's, um, it's just sort of surrounded and this one little, one little um, nook in the midst of the city. And it remains a very um, you know, visible um, you know, indicator that there is a church right here. Mm -hmm. And that's significant. I think there are only probably four, maybe, maybe four um, Protestant church buildings in, in Hanoi proper. There's very few. And because of the various types of uh, historical um, factors in different eras and the different sorts of restrictions that are there. And so, so it's a very big deal for people to gather on a Sunday morning. This is true both for Roman Catholics and for Protestants in Vietnam. And then for, in our context in Northern Vietnam, it became very real, especially for believers from the Hmong culture, which is a, a minority group in Northern Vietnam, probably 1 million ethnic Hmong. And in the late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, through a radio ministry, lots of Hmong people came to know Christ, and they they received real strong pushback in that regard uh, because of some connections that has with um, Hmong identity and and being distinct from Vietnamese identity. But in the year two thousand five, the Vietnamese government recognized existing Hmong church groups as legitimate churches with the right to gather. Mm -hmm. And that was a significant step for them. And in the life of my students, usually in their parents' lives, a huge step because it meant that they now have a formal place in their culture. And so one thing we've done with the, the Hmong students is, is, is have them just draw, draw a map of your hometown with every spiritually significant place on it. And um, it's amazing what you get because people come up with all sorts of funny stuff or, you know, obviously you get things like graveyards and, and uh, maybe and, 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 and um, some uh, sort of clan or family um, altars that, that exist in Vietnam. But, and then sometimes they'll say, well, actually here in the woods out here, there's a place that nobody goes to because it's cursed. Like you're just, you, there's a taboo about that. But one fascinating element 
was that the churches in these communities do play a prominent role. And they, they, are, they are situated in a place where people can gather and people tend, the Christians tend to live around, around the churches. And so you have how a, a, the, the church as a gathering community is a very strong statement. Um, it proclaims that, they're, that we are living for Christ. Now, in both places, in Vietnam, especially today, that doesn't mean you're less Vietnamese, right? It doesn't mean you want to overthrow the government. It simply means that there is, a, there is another king, and, he, and his will is significant for, for this group of people. And uh, so, so that's one thing I've noticed in both of those places. The gathering of God's people is a, is a very significant act. That's really insightful. And, and I think something that you, you, you touched on, to do with um, the, the, the cultural concept of top-down or authoritarian mm -hmm. leadership structures. Is that something that you can see as a challenge even within the church in terms of leadership and how um, things can, can develop within church context? Because it's been something uh, over the last a uh, couple of years, particularly, I think, in the Western world, we've had those sorts of discussions going around about mm. um, of how do we lead well uh, and, and not um, overstep the mark in terms of authoritarian leadership. Um, mm. is, is that something that you see as a challenge um, as a result of cultural um, aspects of communism within the, the churches in Ukraine and, and, and Vietnam as well? Well, and the the leadership leadership is is so challenging, isn't it? It's in every yeah. culture, and so there's no there's no way to avoid that. We're very fallen people, and and structures get get made in this regard. So so most of East Asia, so including you know Vietnam, China, Korea, Japan, have 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 a fairly hierarchical leadership style anyway. So lots of respect for those who are elder, for older, those who are in positions of authority. The 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 title of authority is very important mm. and and so so that's going to be pervade that culture mm. and i think the challenge for for churches all over east asia you know is is how to is how to recognize that as a part of the culture and and yet still hear gospel words that would that would tell us both to respect those who are in authority but also to have to be ready for critically evaluating um, the church itself and and those in leadership and and so i think what we want to teach especially for students is that is that really justification by faith helps us with that a little bit in that as if we are constantly reminding ourselves that we're sinners saved by grace that will push us to a type of vulnerability that doesn't demand doesn't demand unconditional respect from from other people because we recognize before god uh, we, we don't deserve that while also saying Honor your father and mother is in there. Respect your leaders. Obey your leaders. Right? These are all in this in scripture. And so the the blessing of a of an East Asian culture and Vietnamese in particular is that 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 people are willing to say, you know, this may be a time when I need to follow, <laughs> yeah. and they're okay with that, yeah. Yeah. and and recognize, you know, I disagree with the leadership decision, but it was it was made, and so I need to adjust to that. And so I I want to I want to. I mentioned mentioned that as a as a challenge because it's 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 a part of all the East Asian cultures and and Vietnam would have it in in, in its own particular ways. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just want to move on because I know the time's pressing on. We will need to wrap up uh, in just a little bit. I, I wanted to just highlight. Um, uh, you, you did a review of um, E.D. Burns' book, Missionary Theologian, uh, earlier this year for the Gospel Coalition. Um, and uh, it was one of those moments uh, I saw it pop up on my, my socials and I went, hey, I've, I've chatted to this guy before. Um, so I decided I would have a read of the review um, and it was, it was really insightful. I, I know that something that you, you're passionate about and clearly has come through in the, the conversation we've had is this concept of uh, theological education, but, but also cross-cultural theological education. And, and this idea of a, a missionary theologian is something that in that review uh, you, you seek to try and sum up, give a bit of definition to. Um, could you just share a little bit um, 
uh, for us, John, uh, about how you can see the importance of that role. And, and maybe as we move further into the 21st century, um, some of the ways that that might, that might express itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the, <laughs> Just that's a, a great question. question. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> No, so so Evan Burns, who who wrote that book, is is by missionary theologian. I think he wanted to say that missionaries need to also be theologians. That is, you shouldn't go to the mission field if you're not interested in 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 how how God's in this work and what does it say about God when you when you do different things. Yeah, we're and there's not, a lot. Yeah, we're not just going out with pragmatism. Um, we're going to go and do stuff, we're going to go and put things in and everything's going to be fine. We, we actually need to have thought things through. Yeah, mm-hmm. Absolutely. And so so he's pushing for that. And, but I caught on to that title and I, I really love it because of the use of the term pastor theologian mm-hmm. today for, for someone who's in the role of pastoring, who's shepherding the church and who believes that that practice of forming a community of the gospel is is actually going to help us to be better theologians, to actually think about God's purposes in the world based on what God is doing um, in these in these in uh, in the in the real front lines of of gospel community in the church, and and so I felt I sense I, I, I that, that I want to put those two things together, missionary and theologian, in the same way they put pastor and theologian together. And so the missionary theologian here is is, is the idea that that the church and the global church needs representatives who can who can be bridge figures. Mm-hmm. among v- various things, both culturally, that's what missionaries are often doing, but also theologically in bridging gaps between sort of the practice on the ground of a certain place and the larger discussion of what God is doing in the world and how that's shown to us in scripture. And so what I what I felt I want to, and, and this is obviously this review ends up being a bit of a personal statement of where I, I want to be. I want to be this sort of person who can who can help us help the particular culture where we're embedded to to not only you know engage that culture, but also to take that step back and say how how would the the history of Christian theology, how does our exposition and reading of scripture, how does our understanding of God as it's developed over the centuries inform what we're now doing in this particular uh, case? So, and, and I'm responding to the idea that missionaries come with baggage. Okay, so this is the 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 trope that missionaries sort of you know come in with their their well wh- whether it's American or or Scottish uh, you know baggage. I mean, Presbyterianism is is completely baggage free. I mean, it, yeah. <laughs> you pretty much just read your Bible and come up with that, right? So <laughs> the. Um, yeah, so they, they come in with baggage, and 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 I had heard someone use them, you know, th- question that metaphor, and 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 I want to as well because because in reality, when we travel, baggage is actually the things we deem essential to take with us. In fact, when we our family moves to Vietnam, you know, we have a limited number of suitcases. Every time we have to say, well, we can't take everything, and you know, I have to tell my daughters like. You can't take 30 stuffed animals. It's just not going to fit in the bag. It physically will not go in there. Or, or my older daughter, no, you can't take, you know, 10 three-inch books, like, you know, uh, novels and things that you, like, you have to read the Kindle version. We cannot take that many pounds with us. Um, in the same way, a missionary does bring baggage with them, but the things you bring with you, if you are self-critical and recognizing this, could be that which is helpful and essential. And so we want to carry with us, we, we want to bear with us the tra- a tradition in a low T, you know, low, lowercase sense of tradition, that which God has passed on to us through the church and through, uh, through the centuries. And so the missionary theologian is, is not just a baggage handler, hopefully, but right, somebody who, who will, who will uh, dive into a new culture and yet have one foot that's out that says, hey, let me bring together and bridge gaps here between cultures, times, epochs, theologies, and those sorts of things. That is fantastic um and it's, it's really nice as well i've never really thought about it like that that um but I, i'd thought about it but not in the way you phrased it about being people who bring baggage but 
that being good by age. Um, that's 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 super. Um, and it's something that, regardless our context, actually, is something which is applicable. I mean, we might move somewhere within Scotland, we might move somewhere within Europe or in our part of the world. And, you know, the way that God and his providence has worked in our life um, may well have shaped us in specific ways. And the tradition that we've grown up through um, uh, shaped us in specific ways to, to be a blessing um, to those who don't yet know Christ, but also to to, to those who do, and uh, to see them grow and uh, and uh, serve Him uh, in His world, that's a really nice way to to think about it. So it's okay if we take our baggage uh, as long as it's the right. <laughs> well, time. you know, you need to yeah, you need to you need to check your baggage very carefully, right? This is not a uh, yeah. <laughs> a lot of mistakes have been made in in bringing the wrong sort of baggage. You, you know, the, those who bring their their concealed weapon on the plane or something like that. So we want to... Yeah, that tends not to end well. <laughs> That's super. Well, John, um, I think we're going to need to wrap up um, just now. Um, but one final thing that we need to say is that just before we started this conversation, uh, John was getting excited about the fact that I have some Star Trek models behind me. <laughs> and we have both said uh, that Deep Space Nine is definitely the best Star Trek series to watch. So maybe over the Christmas holidays, that's something that both of us would recommend. You can get a chance to watch that. Um, mm. Now, after my advert's gone, um, I'll put some links uh, in the, 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 the episode notes uh, below the podcast um, for the review uh, that John has done on um, Burnsley's Missionary Theologian and also to, to Training Leaders International as well. Um, John, thank you so much for taking the time to, to chat with me uh, and to share with our listeners. Um, it's, been a, it's been a great privilege to, to hear from you and to hear what your family are involved in and what the Lord's doing through you guys. Um, may you know his blessings as you, you move forward and as you look to the future. Um, and um, from me, uh, Martin Patterson, your host uh, today, I'll sign off this episode of the Generation Podcast. Thanks for listening. Okay, thank you so much, Martin. <laughs>